Welcome to episode 14 of Caucus Live, brought to you by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. I'm your host, Sarah Hauptman. Today we're going to talk about situational awareness. It's a term that gets tossed around a lot, but what does it actually mean, and how does it apply to your daily life? We'll also talk about how your situational awareness might change when you or someone you love has a disability or special needs. Welcome to episode 14 of Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. We're broadcasting live from Maplewood, Minnesota. Let us know where you're watching from. And as always, if you have questions during the show, try to get them in before we go to break. Today, we're talking about a term you've probably heard if you've been active in the gun community for a while, and that is situational awareness. It's one of those things that's so overused that it's almost become become kind of like a meaningless buzzword. But today we're going to go back to basics. We're going to talk about what situational awareness really is, why it's useful for your average citizen self-defender, and how to practice it. Our guests today are John Murphy, John, sorry, John Murphy and Stephanie Widener. John Murphy did 10 years in the Marine Corps and currently works for the Department of Defense. As an instructor, John has incorporated the best and most practical methods and techniques into his courses, and he continues to train and refine his skills every year, both as a defensive shooter and as a trainer. John has presented classroom and range instruction at multiple Range Master conferences and currently holds a Master Instructor rating from Range Master. He's also a graduate of Masada Ayub's Lethal Force Instructor Program. Hey, John, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Stephanie Widener is the CEO of Active Self-Protection, a defensive training company based out of Phoenix. They're best known for their social media arm where they analyze self-defense encounters for basic principles and lessons learned. Stephanie is the wife to one, mother to five, and grandma to two, including a special needs son who helped her to begin her journey into the self-defense world 15 years ago and continues to inform her thoughts and training today. Thanks for joining us, Steph. I'm so happy to be here, Sarah. Thanks for having me. All right, so let's jump right into the the good stuff here. Uh, So let's talk situational awareness. So to start with, how would you define situational awareness? Uh, Let's start with you on that one, John. What do you think? Well, I'll uh, I'll default to my I'll default to my mentor, Tom Gibbons. Uh, The executive summary would be who is around me and what they are doing. Now, to that, I would add a more holistic view, and where is this taking place? Uh, Obviously, the rules in a a biker bar would be different than rules in a a gentleman's drinking club. Uh, And what we're looking for, we want to become more attuned to what doesn't belong in that particular environment at that time. What behavior is not contextual? Gotcha. So you're, it sounds like you're kind of saying situational awareness is a flexible thing, kind of like a fluid thing. That's a, that'd be a, a fine summation. Uh, there are certain basic principles. Obviously, you have to be head up and, 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 and cognizant of who is doing what. But I think it's very much going to be where, not, where you are and what's going on around you as a normal ebb and flow of life. Gotcha. All right, Steph, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, I think that a lot of time the the Second Amendment or self defense community tends to use it as a as a. Tr- I mean, it means to be situationally aware, obviously. But then I think we take it 
to me to have a broader meaning of to be aware of developing threats around you, which I think it's, you know, the term situational awareness is actually too too broad to contain what we mean precisely. I think you have to be aware of not only the situation that you're in, but also some personal awareness, some environmental awareness, all of these things. And and we tend to use this like catch all term of situational awareness to mean all of that. Um, but I'm not sure it does a great job of conveying exactly what we intend it to, which is being aware of what's going on around you, who's around you, developing threats or maybe interesting things you might wanna be a part of. Um, so, so I don't know, like you, like you were saying at the beginning, it's kind of an odd buzzword term that I'm not sure conveys what we really intend it to mean sometimes. Yeah, I, I kind of get that impression too, especially after, um, you know, like the more classes I take and the more training I get and the more I learn, the more I kind of think that uh, it's one of those terms that's, that's really broadly like abused almost. Cause you know, people will see, for example, uh, like active self-protection, they do a ton, a ton of like surveillance videos of like actual crimes that have been committed against people. And a lot of times you'll hear people say, well, they should have just had better situational awareness and this never would have happened. But I feel like that's right. almost an unrealistic like way to think of it because it's you're not really like living your entire life like this. Right. So like for sure. Uh, what is, uh, you know, I guess I would, I'm curious, like, how does uh, good situational awareness change your habits? Like, does it mean you have to live like a Navy SEAL or is there anything, you know, kind of like a normal person can do? Uh, Steph, let's start with you I on that one. Okay. Uh, I think on one level, it doesn't matter if it requires you to live like a Navy SEAL 100% of the time because you cannot do that. You cannot um, live in this heightened state of awareness all the time and actually live this, this life worth living, which is something we spend a lot of time talking about, at least among my friends, that, that yes, we want to we wanna do some risk mit mitigation and assessment, but we also want to live. And if I'm in this constant state of watching for something that might hurt me, I'm not going to be able to do that either. So, um, so yeah, I guess it doesn't matter if that's the requirement, you can't do it. But what we can do is maybe if we remove that, you know, high speed term that, that sounds a lot cooler than, hey, just be present in the moment or maybe pay attention to what's going on around you. I think that conveys um, a little bit closer to the meaning and the lesson that we're trying to to show people. Just uh, be present in that moment, be paying attention to what uh John was was talking about things that aren't quite right contextually, someone that might be paying a little bit too much attention to you, that sort of thing. And it doesn't require you being this hyper vigilant, never letting your back down, never turning your back to anyone or anything mentality. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. And, and it does kind of tie into what John was saying, too, is like maybe you're not you're not alert to everything. Like you're not the dog that barks at the mailman and, you know, the plastic bag right. and then the other dog but maybe you're more alert to things that are different or out of place so you know I think that's maybe one way to think of it to um to kind of reduce the amount of stimulus you need to respond to uh John what do you think of that mm -hmm. I think that was an excellent summation uh and your your point well let me back up a bit much of this is derived from from military speak uh We've, we've, we've all heard of Cooper's colors, condition white, yellow, orange, and red. And then they've uh, had others, uh, you know, there's mauve and chartreuse now or whatever. Uh, and fighter pilots uh, kind of, I think, initiated that, the term situational awareness. Of, uh, they would describe someone as he had good SA in a dogfight if he's turning left and right and he's avoiding guys and shooting down other guys. They would say he had good SA. That is not our context remotely. There are certain indicators and clues that we need to be pl plugged into, the absence of which or the addition of which in any situation are things that should make make our dog bark, as it were. And I'll, I'll add one, inject one more thing. The best situational awareness in the world is worthless without the will and capacity to act upon that information. Yeah, okay, so that, that also makes sense to me. So it's not just like, what did you notice in your environment? But it's like, how are you going to respond to that? And what are you going to do about it? All right. So 
real quick, I want to give a quick shout out to Andrew in Taylor's Falls uh, because Andrew has watched, I think, every single show. And I feel like we need like some awards <laughs> for our for our viewers uh, because they ask great questions. Uh, and we really appreciate having you guys and Andrew, especially thanks for being with us from the beginning and uh, thanks for sticking with us. Uh, but to get back into our topic here before we stray too far. Uh, so in your opinion, and uh, John, we'll, we'll pick on you again for this one. What kind of problems does your typical civilian self-defender need to be aware of and be prepared for? The typical self-defender needs to be first cognizant of their ego. Uh, it's a, a common saying of uh, they're, not, they're not aware of what they're projecting quite, quite, uh, quite frequently. Uh, manners, address, speech, association, wh what have you. Uh, the first part of any problem is, well, any potential problem is going to be them. And I think people need to come to that realization that they are part of that equation. And Steph, anything to add to that? I think one of the biggest things that people face, and I know this is something I fought through for years and continue to fight through, is um, I don't think we understand violent criminal actors very well, to, to borrow a term from the late William April. We tend to project our own intentions and desires onto other people and assume because I wouldn't do something or I would do something that, that this other person would or wouldn't do that as well. And and it's really difficult for us to make that leap and understand that no, there are people that are that are radically different and are willing to, uh, they, they value and judge uh, actions and and risk reward a whole lot differently than you do, and I think that that is it. That is a really difficult leap for a lot of good, uh, good-hearted people. Yeah, I was I was fortunate enough to take one class with uh, with the late uh, Dr. April, yeah. and one of the things he said in class that really stuck with me is, "They are not like you," and yes. you oh, can't you can't assume that because you know you would never act in this way that that a criminal would never act right. in this way it's like a totally different yeah. uh way of looking at the world and it's definitely worth understanding better yeah uh, i so was fortunate enough to take a class as well and that was you know just a huge a huge takeaway on that for me and on one level it makes sense mentally but i find myself that that my heart has a hard time understanding that sometimes so i really uh really try to fight through that and i think that's probably something a lot of people struggle with yeah, and that's another thing too, like uh, for, for some of the ASP videos as well, is you'll see a lot of people in the comments saying, why? Like, why did this person right. do that? They'll watch a video of some, of some horrible crime and they'll just ask why. Right. And that is an important question, but in the moment, it's really not relevant. Like, it's hard to overcome that like shock and think to yourself, right. like, why is this happening to me? Is this real? Is this really happening? But but it's one of those things that it doesn't matter why, it just matters how you react. I think people think if they can understand it, they can somehow avoid it or stop it or control it somehow. And, and there probably is some value into trying to understand the why outside of the situation. But yeah, mm -hmm. you're exactly right. In the moment, uh, it's completely irrelevant why or what someone's motivation is. It's just that it's happening and you need to respond to it. Right. Yeah. It seems like the difference between like studying and taking the exam, like definitely study right. it, right? <laughs> but be ready yes, for the but... exam. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Uh, so John, we'll start with you on this one again. So what do you think in your opinion, uh, what are some warning signs that might mean that you're being targeted for a, a violent crime? Uh, I'll, I'll default to my YouTube channel and I have a, a video up there entitled, uh, uh, concealed carry criminal assault pre-incident indicators. The number one indicator of impending interaction is deliberate movement towards you. Uh, it could be past barrier, uh, past a barrier. They orient on you uh, in a manner in order to achieve proximity, which they will achieve either by negotiation or just by absolute direct motion and force. That is the number one indicator of an impending interaction. Now, what that can turn into, it can be any, any number of things. It can be just a shakedown. Uh, if you are an adherent of Craig Douglas's Managing Unknown Contacts, Muck, 
and I, I would highly recommend that that portion of his curriculum to anyone. If you get that, hey man, would you stay right there? And that person disregards your request. I'm fond of saying that movement is eloquent communication, and they're conveying to you all you need to know about their, uh, if not their their capability, but certainly their intent. They mean to close the, the gap with you. So if I'm just walking down the street and uh, somebody approaches me and I see them orient to me and look at me and move directly towards me, that's like a red flag. Huge red flag. And you might get something like this. Let me see if I can, if I can do it I'll be with, a, with a timed lag here. They'll do a few target glances for, for an assessment. And like, oh, yes, she is totally into her phone right now. I mean, when you take into account that this will be his 45th armed robbery or assault or whatever, They'll do and a this few is your first. For, for an assessment? <laughs> uh, and, and he has a certain template in his mind, and this person has a template in their mind of what it's supposed to look like. And if you fulfill those, those criteria, that template, well, then then off we go. Okay, so that's kind of a like a pre-signal that you are in some trouble here, is if somebody takes the time to kind of just casually pick you out and then glance at you a couple times and then orient towards you. Absolutely. Uh, I had an incident some years ago in D.C. Uh, I was walking down a sidewalk, and there were two gentlemen – in the sidewalk, one facing me, one facing away, and, the, and they were having a very loud conversation. The guy facing me nodded his head. His partner did this, and it was movement associated with my arrival onto the scene, which is another huge indicator. Like that was not verbal communication. Like, okay, here he comes, and then, yep, I got him, and I. Well, we're default to William April again. I engaged in what he referred to as heuristic completion, and that was I kept walking down the sidewalk, knowing full well what it was because, well, I was young and foolish then. Hmm. So that's kind of like when you walk into a room and all of a sudden everybody stops talking and you know they were talking about you. About you. <laughs> okay, yeah. so that's – that's kind of a, a feeling that most people are familiar with. So maybe that's a way to, to kind of conceptualize what that might look like. Uh, Steph, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, not too much. I think a lot of it boils down to uh, that people paying inappropriate attention to you. And I don't necessarily mean like inappropriate in the way that if you were a female and a man was, you know, behaving sort of oddly, aggressively that way, it, as much as inappropriate for that moment. It's not, we have an appropriate amount of eye contact and uh, attention that we pay to people that we pass on the street or that we are in a grocery store line with or, or anything like that. There's an appropriate amount of, of attention there. And if someone is paying, you know, way more attention than that or not enough attention or just behaving oddly, there may be a, an absolutely wonderful, good reason why they are doing that. Um, it also is, is an indication that there's a problem. It's those types of, to pick up on what John was saying before, things that are out of context, out of ordinary, things that they make you wonder why that is. Things should, our, our brain looks for patterns and things to be the way they are supposed to be when they are not that way. You should at least start to get curious and wonder why. Pay a little more attention yourself and start to start to dig into it. Maybe you realize mm, that person was maybe just kind of spacing out and didn't realize they were looking at me that long as we as we passed by, but you don't really pay any penalties for, for paying more attention and, and digging a little bit deeper. You may pay a, a pretty high penalty if you don't get a little more curious about, about why it's happening. Gotcha. Yeah, I got that. All right. Uh, so before we go to break here, I just want to real quick uh, get into a couple more questions. And the first one is what, what do criminals look for? And we'll, we'll pick on you again for, for this one, John. Uh, are there any particular uh, selection factors that make you more likely to be selected by a criminal? Absolutely. And uh, again, much of my learning in this regard came from, from Dr. April. Uh, he referred me to a, a, a book, a study entitled The Power of Gates, G-A-I-T-S, The Power of Gates, the way it can be the way you walk. 
It could be your attentiveness to the situation. It could be your behavior. If you enter a respect culture and behave disrespe disrespectfully, uh, ignorantly or not, you can expect some kind of confrontation as a result of that. Uh, inattentiveness, uh, and then there's always the, uh, if you allow yourself to become chemically altered, alcohol or whatever in, in certain environments, you're just, you are feeding the prey drive of essentially of a predator that has, again, that template in mind. And they are not like us, again. And that is, can, can be the, the precedent to trigger the, the, uh, the assault or the attack or the, the robbery. Uh, it can be just simple predation. And then we're seeing more and more, of course, just people turning over and not, slapping people upside the head. And in fact, there's no real, uh, other than proximity, there's no way to predict that. And I'm going to combine these questions a little bit for you, Stephanie. Uh, so okay. for one, what do criminals look for? And then uh, you, you have a little different area of expertise on this, and I'm really curious what your perspective is. Uh, so what do criminals look for? And then what if you or somebody you love has a disability or a special need? So there's maybe something about you um, that you can't control. Uh, it, and how does that affect what criminals look for and, and how they select potential victims? I think um, you can boil down a lot of what they're looking for to um, a risk versus reward type of equation. And they may run that quite a bit different than you can. Um, so if you have something valuable enough worth their trouble, wh whatever that is, um, then it's worth them thinking about taking it from you. And if you have something more valuable, they may be willing to risk more to take it. Um, so a lot of times people think something like a, like a openly carried gun might be in a deterrent. And for some people it might be, for others it might be, oh, that's a very expensive, valuable item that it is worth me risking more to get. Y you just don't know how they're going to run that equation. Um, so I think that's what they're looking for, an appropriate reward worth what they are willing to risk for it. Um, so yes, I have a, a son who will likely be in my care for the rest of my life, certainly. Um, and this is, it's really one of the things that got me started on my journey uh, with self-defense. But one, I realized very quickly when we were kind of being interviewed by someone that I suspect was was interested in, in robbing us if they could, um, I was trying to send every social cue in the world to my son to stop talking and help me disengage from the situation we're in without getting too far into the weeds. And he was not getting it. Here was a woman that needed a help. And I'm like, no, son, this is not what is happening this is we're fixing to get robbed here and it was a, it was very obvious and so we we were able to to get away from that situation and um i went home and i thought if i had told um i also have four daughters if i had used the tone of voice that i'd used and with the look that i was using they would have picked up very quickly on this may not make sense to you, but follow mom's lead right now. And I realized my son was never going to pick up on any of that. Uh, beyond that, also, I spend a great deal of uh, my resource margin invested in that. So a lot of my attention, a lot of my time and focus is on making sure life is good, taking care of my son out in public, which leaves me um, a more vulnerable target. Um, I've got less attention, less focus, less all of that stuff. So um, that that's something that I have to be aware of, and and it really informs how I train. And it may be maybe you don't have someone with special needs or a, or a disability, but we talk about everybody. I think goes through different times or places or situations where they may be more vulnerable than other times. If you're recovering from some type of surgery, you might be projecting signals uh, to pick up on what John was saying that you that you wouldn't normally, but now you look much more vulnerable than you did a while back. It may be a you know a a parking garage that you have to walk through every night after work where you're more vulnerable there than you normally would be. So I think we all go through these vulnerable times and uh, times when we're not at the top of our game because we cannot be. Um, so I think it's really something important to think about and think through. Yeah, that actually happened to me not too long ago. A, a month or two ago, I threw my back out. And I know mm -hmm. like I looked like an easy target at that point because I was like, walking like I was old and I was looking right. slow and I was definitely not looking fit. Uh, so yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, 
whether it's a, a temporary or a permanent thing, whether it's something you can control or something you can't, I think it's really important mm-hmm. to to just kind of know what your limitations are. And like you said, to factor that into your training, that's that's really key. Right. Yeah, right. So I think, to, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, I, I didn't know if you, how far you wanted to get into it right here or not. I think even just starting by taking this a super honest account of where you're at, uh, places where you may have more or less um, risk or risk tolerance, what gifts you have, what you can do to mitigate those. I mean, I can sit here and, and talk in depth to what I have done to try to mitigate and change some of my factors, but it's not going to be super relevant to somebody that's concerned about helping with an elderly parent that they have. Um, so it's it's so situationally dependent, but I think it starts with a good, honest accounting of your, your pros and cons there. All right, so we're gonna take a quick break. Uh, when we get back, we're gonna talk a little bit about how to avoid being selected uh, as a victim of crime. Hi, it's Brian Strauser, chairman of the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. We are a single issue, nonpartisan Second Amendment advocacy group. Our mission is to protect and advance the right of citizens to keep and bear arms. We believe that law abiding citizens should be able to own and use firearms for all lawful purposes, including self defense, competition, hunting, and the shooting sports. Please consider joining us as a Second Amendment defender with support as low as $5 a month, or choose one of our other annual membership options. You can learn more about us at gunowners.mn and become a member at gunowners.mn slash join. Welcome back to Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. We're talking to Stephanie Widener of Active Self-Protection and John Murphy of FPF Training. So we just talked a little bit about the warning signs of violent crime and some of the factors that affect victim selection. So up next, we're going to talk a little bit about what you can do to avoid being targeted for a crime. Uh, So let's start with you this time, Steph. We haven't picked on you nearly enough. Uh, So what are some (laughs) things you can do in your daily life uh, to avoid being selected for a crime? Uh, I think so much of it so much of it goes back to something so simple, just paying attention and be present in your moment, looking for those uh, outlying oddities that that let you know something isn't quite right or at least something isn't quite normal. Um, I think that's a really good place to start. Uh, the second place I would say is don't be afraid to act on that when you see it. If you're starting to get um, any concern or any sort of tingling on the back of your neck that something is afoot, I think, um, Speaking as a woman, I think women in particular get very concerned about bucking social convention and being seen as rude or um, uh, overreacting, any number of these other things. So my, I think one of the biggest things you can probably do is be looking for those oddities, be curious and willing to explore why they are there and be ready to act, even if that means you do something that, that's socially odd. Maybe you speak very firmly to someone that's starting to come in your space. I know for a lot of people that's... Um, would be a very difficult thing to do. Maybe it means you walk out of a store, you know, and leave your grocery cart in the middle of it because something very odd is brewing around you. Don't be afraid to to do something that is considered rude, normal, or not normal, odd, any of those things. And John, what do you have to add to that? I would add further along that line, general demeanor. Uh, Stephanie spoke earlier about the risk-benefit analysis equation. Well, they've got one. They do. And we need to, to move that needle one way, one way our way. And we can do that by having our head up, looking around, giving a, 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 an acknowledgement, verbal, you know, I see you. You're not going to surprise me. This, this is not going to go the way you might think. And you should look elsewhere. And it's all in, in carriage and, again, the power of gates. So that's kind of a proactive thing you can do just to acknowledge, like, okay, I see you, <laughs> and you might get Sarah, me. Sarah, can I pick up on that? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I just what what John said was so brilliant, and I just wanted to expand on it a little bit because I think it's something that women sort of instinctively don't do. I think there's some we worry that there's some sort of signal when we look at someone that we consider as a threat that we're inviting conversation or we're inviting attention. So if you want the waiter's attention, 
you look at them. And so I, I see, we see in a lot of videos actually, when women realize they are being targeted, the first thing they often do is look down in a way. And I think they're doing that just to sort of say, I don't want to communicate. I don't want to invite any interaction at all. And it, what John said, I think is exactly right. You're not trying to be disrespectful or challenging or anything like that. You're just simply trying to say, I see you. And I think it also sends the message. I also don't behave in a way that every other person does. You were expecting me to look down in a way I did not. And so now I'm a little more unpredictable to you. You may want to go on to somebody that's going to behave a little more predictably. Yeah, so that could change their risk calculus a little bit, just something as simple as a, a direct look. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, you know, I, I do know exactly what you mean on that, because uh, as a female, if I if I sense that there is a male looking directly at me, uh, a lot of times I will like deliberately not look at them because I don't want them to take my eye contact as like an invitation or like that I'm trying to flirt with them or that I'm open to being hit on, which I'm most definitely not. Yep. So, so it is kind of like a habitual. We see that all the time. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like a, it's like a habitual um, avoidance of direct eye contact. I yeah, think so, and. Um I mean, we've noticed it over and over again on videos, even uh, there's one I'm thinking of in particular, that male police officer, and it was a very obvious threat. She obviously saw it, but then she immediately was down and away. And that was the moment that, that he chose to kind of come in. And I thought, I, I think we're just kind of programmed that that's just our signal to people. I don't want any part of this. I don't want a conversation with you. And I, I mean, you're probably as aware as I am, if a guy is trying to to see if you are open to flirting and you meet that eye contact, then, you, then you've got that. That's the signal, let's start talking. So I suppose there's a way to balance it, but even, but even with anything, just being aware of the fact that, that if you're seeing something that, that's more threatening, I think it'd be really good to just acknowledge, I see you and, and I'm not like everybody else. Yeah, that's really good. I like that a lot because it's like, all right, I see you and you might still get me, but at least I see you coming. Mm -hmm. and. You know, I suppose the other way to look at it, so like a criminal has a risk calculus when they decide to target you and you also have a risk calculus uh, when you decide what to do about their actions. So I think for me, mm -hmm. um, after, you know, what you said was, was just really spot on, I think. Um, for me, that changes my risk calcul calculus a little bit because if mm -hmm. I make eye contact and I'm wrong, then all I have to deal with is being hit on and saying no thanks. Uh, mm -hmm. But if I make eye contact and I'm right and they were trying to target me and then that potentially avoids an attack, uh, yeah, that's definitely like the better option there, it seems like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I mean, like, that's kind of where it comes down to to what I do and my choices. I think if nothing else, it sends a, I'm a little bit different and you're going to have to decide if you're willing to risk my unpredictability. Um I might just be a grandma or whatever, but I, I might be an awful lot of trouble for you too. Yeah, you gotta work for it. <laughs> right. And John, you look like you have something to add. Stephanie is talking about injecting a question mark into the equation. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, am, I am departing from your script because this is a whole different <laughs> Here play. Oh yeah, yeah go for so, it. So you, 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 well, and, and my, what I'm saying, you are communicating that he has a script, this person has a script for whatever purpose, and you are now going to depart this script. I would also caution to avoid the wolf stare. Mm. In some cultures, that that can become very, uh, very much a challenge, and then you actually you are exacerbating your problem with that. That look. Yeah, and can you elaborate just, a little bit of what you mean by the wolf stare? Just the stare down, like, yeah, man, let's do it. Yeah, yeah, what do you want? You want some of this, huh? Huh? You want some of this, huh? Gotcha. And that can become very, that can become very challenging, and then. You, you, then you have just strummed what I call the first chord in dueling banjos. Mm -hmm. Got it. I don't, I'm not going to grab that whole movie, yeah. but. Yeah, so there's a little bit of a fine line there you want to acknowledge right. like, no, without I, challenging. I see you. I see you. I, see you. I, think, but, I think that's exactly what you're going for, the I see you. It's not a challenge. It's not disrespectful. It's not dismissive. It's just I see you. And we've got a quick audience question here. I just want to pop up. Uh, so Nick asks, is there a difference between situa situational awareness and hypervigilance? I think we did kind of cover that a little bit in the beginning. Um, but do either of you guys uh, want to touch on that and, and say, like, what's the difference uh, between hypervigilance and situational awareness? 
I would have to say that hypervigilance would be just so situationally defined. There would have to be a number of indicators going our way. I, I, any one or one or two may or may not be a thing, but if I got four or five indicators, a loud, obnoxious voice, people advancing on me, people oriented at me, people giving me the pointing at me for action, that would require a moment of extreme introspection and hypervigilance. But as for maintaining that level of alertness throughout, it's, it, it, we're back to the, to the gun store talk of I'm always in condition yellow. And, and, and very, inevitably, that's someone who is open carrying that will turn his back on somebody and, and that can just get that pistol snatched. But and, and that's it, – it, it's, it's situationally appropriate, but it's very difficult to maintain for any period of time. Okay, yeah, and that cuts, cuts to the core of the question, in my opinion. You know, I interpret that question as, like, how much is too much? And so it sounds like what you're saying is like, is this a level of, of vigilance you can actually maintain? And if not, maybe it's appropriate for if you get a red flag, like to use it kind of situationally and, and let it change as the moment changes. All right. Uh, so I think we already covered this next question pretty well, but uh, I was going to ask if situational awareness can help prevent us from becoming targets. But from what we have already discussed, it sounds like it really kind of can uh, just by being aware, doing that quick acknowledgement and uh, just preparing yourself to act if you need to. Uh, but how can we practice good situational awareness habits in our daily lives? Uh, Stephanie, let's start with you on this one. I think, I think the answer is so simple. It's almost kind of deceptive, just paying attention and being engaged and curious about the world around you. Um, I think that's a good balance between being able to live a, a, a full, rich, joyful life and also protecting yourself and those that you love. Just be be curious and engaged in the world around you. Don't be, um, and that just goes to really, really good advice, like not being absorbed in your phone while you're out in public. And you can't do that if you're engaged and curious about the world around you. And and yeah, like I, said, I think it's it sounds deceptively simple, but I think that's really really a huge first step to mitigate a lot of problems. So it's a mindset thing almost, and not mindset like to enter that hypervigilant state, but just a mindset of, uh, of instead of being absorbed uh, within yourself and focused within yourself, mm -hmm. that you can kind of focus a little bit externally and see what's around you. And uh, John, anything I think so, and I think that, that... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think that adds also to, to the other side of that, living that, that rich life, you're 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 interacting with and engaged with the world around you. So not it's that two pronged. It, it it protects you, but it also enriches your life. Yeah, that's kind of a nice bonus, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and John, what do you think? You, well, Stephanie's point. Uh, you'll catch that odd rainbow <laughs> this way, which is kind of a cool thing. But the, the ability to, to zoom in, uh, I I I will be I'm guilty as anybody else. I'm in a restaurant and I'll be doing the thing. Yeah. But I've got the discipline. I've got the discipline to occasionally do what I, I call it a periscope check, just to make sure that the ebb and flow. I mean, we've all been in restaurants. We know what it's supposed to look like. We know what it's supposed to sound like. We know how people are supposed to interact in those environments. But you got to have that discipline to, ba to break away, get out of that massive Facebook argument over nine millimeter versus forty five or what have you, <laughs> and then, and then. Uh, and, and look and look look around. Uh, one of my one of my heroes, Joe Foss, he's a World War II fighter pilot. He got shot down. He shot down a plane, then he got shot down himself. And you crash landed, and you got out of this airplane, and you said, you know, looking around is a healthy habit. It doesn't cost nothing. That's good. So, That's really good. Yep. Yeah, interesting yeah, man. For me, mm -hmm. kind of one of the way I ways I approach this mindset thing, because um, I'm like just a little bit of a hippie and I like things like yoga and meditation and stuff like that. Um, I approach the situational awareness thing as a practice. Like when you, when you meditate, you don't just go out and meditate, you practice meditation. And when you first start out, it's really hard. Like it's really hard to keep your attention uh, focused on one thing for a while. Um, but as you practice, it gets easier and easier. And I would imagine that the situational awareness is the same way, where it's it's more of a lifestyle, more of a practice. 
Uh, anything, anything in particular to add to that? No, I think I just, I, I would totally agree with that. It can be something that's a little bit odd and foreign and maybe feel like that odd hypervigilance thing where you're constantly scanning and looking. Uh, and it certainly doesn't have to be that and shouldn't have to be that, but it may feel a little bit like that at first. But um, I, I do think the more that you do it, the more that it becomes a lifestyle, the more that I, I'll never forget. There was one moment when we were out uh, for the 4th of July and I looked up and there was a woman um Obviously, it had a lot to drink. She was by herself. She wasn't really paying attention or engaged to the world around her. Uh, and this isn't to blame her, but at that moment, I had the, oh, my goodness. Like, I felt like like I could see the world for just a moment through the eyes of, of a predator, for for lack of a better word, and, and because I was kind of paying attention and scanning and looking, and it was just like this bright neon sign that there was, you know, this woman could run into potential problems throughout the night. And... Um, it was a very odd thing that was very early on in my in my sort of self defense journey. So it was a really odd thing to me to sort of think about seeing the world through through someone else's perspective. And um, I think if we can kind of look at at the reverse of that, the predators are scanning the world looking for exactly that. If you can kind of take some time to think about what they might be doing, what they might be looking for, and how you might be fulfilling that role or not fulfilling that role, so however you want to do it, could be super helpful as well. And, you know, just to circle back to the the thing about hypervigilance, like how much is too much? I think there's an association with uh, situational awareness and like an anxious state. And I just want to be really clear that that's not how I think of it. I don't think of it as an anxious state. I think of it a little bit more as like uh, there's, there's like a concept in like yoga and horseback riding. There's a concept of soft focus where you're not mm. hard focused on a certain thing, but you're just kind of softly aware of everything around you. Uh, and that's not an mm. anxious state. Uh, John, you looked like you had something to add. Let me pick on you for a minute here. You're going full screen. Think about what you're projecting when you are in an anxious state. Those furtive glances around, that is an indicator of extreme discomfort, unease, and might actually be the signal that a criminal predator is looking to find, like, oh, what's this guy's problem? Maybe I should walk over there and find out. Uh, and then, and then by, by doing these, that, these furtive looks, these moves around, it, it just kind of – your body posture and what you, what you, you are transmitting. There are people receiving all the time. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that calm focus seems like such an asset uh, versus when I think of, like, hypervigilance, I think of, like, you know, the, the quick darting glances, like you said, but yeah, that calm, like soft awareness, like you're aware of what's in your peripheral vision and you're aware of what's in front of you and you're listening, you know, and you're kind of using all of your senses at once. That's actually like a really nice mm. and enriching way to be. And it, it's very pleasant. So I think this is actually <laughs> kind of a good uh, life, uh, you know, life move for people too. If they're able to access that state. Uh, now we're we're running a little short on time here before we go to break. But before we uh, take our next break, do you think that carrying a firearm should change how you think about situational awareness? Like, does that change anything about your routine or about your uh, your your threat level or you know your your awareness state? Uh, let's start with you on this one, John. It shouldn't. It it, it certainly should not make any change to the way you behave. Uh, the common, well, I wouldn't go there if I had a gun, if, unless I had a gun. Well, they, you shouldn't be going there if you have a gun, if it's, if it's that bad. Uh, if you are a different person when you are carrying than when you're not, you need to seriously reassess what it is you're about. Because what you're about to do is set yourself up for a massive dramatic failure. And what do you think, Steph? I, I agree with him 100%. I think um, not only should you not behaving, be behaving differently when you have a gun, um, you should still be doing, you know, the, the situational awareness, being curious, um, engaging in life, whether or not you have a gun, you should be doing some sort of threat assessment when you see things kind of uh, that are a little bit awry in your world, whether or not you have a gun. Um, a gun is a tool that can make make that solving certain problems easier if that problem happens to come up, but it certainly certainly shouldn't change anything on the uh, living life part of, of the equation. 
Well, thank you for that. We're going to take a quick break here. Uh, Stick around, because when we come back, we're going to talk about how to train your peripheral firearm skills, such as situational awareness, uh, and also some other things that will help enhance your personal safety. The Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus is a single-issue, nonpartisan Second Amendment advocacy group. Our mission is to protect and advance the rights of citizens to keep and bear arms. We believe that law-abiding citizens should be able to own and use firearms for all lawful purposes, including self-defense, competition, hunting, and shooting sports. Please consider becoming a Second Amendment defender with support as low as $5 a month. You can learn more at gunowners.mn join. Welcome back to Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. Today we're talking to John Murphy and Stephanie Widener about situational awareness. So we talked a little bit before the break about uh, kind of some some different uh, perspectives and philosophies on situational awareness and how to live your life. Uh, So next I want to talk a a little bit more about practical stuff. Like how do you train for it and how do you get better at it? So in your opinion, uh, Stephanie, we'll start with you on this one. How can a person build situational awareness skills? Uh, I think it picks up really well on what you were talking about before. Uh, Start by just practicing. Start by just being aware. Um, Learning how to identify what is the baseline in the environment that you're in. Uh, Like John talked about earlier, we all know what people act like in a restaurant. We all know they might act this way in a less crowded restaurant and this way in a more crowded, fancier restaurant. But we all have an idea what that baseline is. We all have an idea what type of clothes people should be wearing. Nobody's going to be wearing, you know, a wool uh, overcoat in, you know, 100 degree weather. If they are, maybe maybe try to figure that out. So so I think some of some of just that being aware of, of what deviations from baseline are and uh, being willing to act on them. I um, I find myself trying to trying to to be assertive in things uh, where I don't even necessarily have to be, but perhaps maybe drawing more firm boundaries than I need to at different times when interacting with the public just to practice that. It's not comfortable or easy for me to do that. I'm a pretty nice accommodating person and I enjoy interacting with people that I don't know. Um, so I so I will practice practice kind of drawing those boundaries a little firmer than I might normally just just to kind of get that get that done. I think that's that's a few good steps you can take to get along that path. And John, what do you think? You can turn it into something of a game. Uh, I know mm-hmm. I've got my morning commute and I zone out. And occasionally I'll I'll pull myself out of that zone like, hey, what was the color of the car you just passed? If I can't answer it, then I kind of failed. Uh, I was mm-hmm. navigating safely, but I really was I really aware of what was going on. Uh, it, the same thing. What was the color of that 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 uh, that guy that just walked past me? What, what was the color of his shirt? Things of that nature, and you can turn it if you with the, with the couples game. It can be almost like a slug bug kind of thing. Well, I just I just dated myself there. Holy yeah, cow! You did. <laughs> Holy cow! I. Uh, <laughs> and it, can, it, can be, it can become kind of fun, uh, but if but if you are able at the moment to, to, to disengage from being disengaged and hone in and just make it a, a cycle, right? it, it goes a, a long way. And before I would, before you commit to a task, let me just throw this out there: loading the car with groceries, moving the kid into the car, what have you. Do a look around. And just make sure that you are actually in the normal. Mm. Yeah, what you said about checking in kind of reminds me, one of my um, interests is dog training. And there's something we teach with with dogs is just checking in. Uh, like, okay, go sniff that rock over there and then check in with me. And then go do this and check mm-hmm. with me and go do that and check with me. So it seems like kind of a similar process and a similar practice of just training yourself to check in with your surroundings periodically. Uh, so what do you uh, think? Uh, you know what? Actually, I forgot to do this when we came back. I'm going to do this right now. Where can people find you guys online? Stephanie, where can people find you? 
Um, you can find us mainly on our YouTube channel, Active Self Protection. We do after action reports, lessons learned on uh, different defensive encounters. We post one every single day, sometimes twice a day, 365 days a year. We also have a training channel called Active Self Protection Extra, where we post uh, shooting and training videos, pistols, rifles. We have legal lessons learned. We have we try to do something, talk about different things in the industry all throughout. We have a Facebook page. We do different seminars and classes around the country, and we are just getting ready to open registration for our national conference in September in just outside of Manhattan, Kansas, which I am, of course, super excited about, which you were at, Sarah, this last year and the year before. So, yeah, it was uh, great. Yeah. Highly recommend yeah, it. Super good. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, I've noticed a phenomenon where I started watching dash cam videos for a while there. And mm -hmm. after watching like a couple hours worth of dash cam accidents, after a while you could predict when the accidents would happen. And you could see like, it was just kind of like a subconscious thing, but you could be like, oop, that's going yeah. down. And I've noticed <laughs> a similar effect when watching active self-protection videos. And it's almost like you, you sensitize sure. yourself to the warning signs just by watching, uh, you know, crimes happen. Absolutely. The brain doesn't really know the difference between virtual training. That's why you're able to do like flight simulators and things like that. Why when you watch a roller coaster kind of first person viewpoint on on TV or online, you can feel your stomach going uh, mm -hmm. because the brain learns. We can we can learn the lessons that the people in them paid a great deal for and we can learn them. In fact, we were at uh, uh, virtual, which is a virtual training uh, 300 degrees uh, thing the other day. We're in the middle of this live uh, simulation and it was so funny because I found myself watching the action just just analyzing what was happening and trying to find the problem and solve it which is what I kind of do in my everyday life on the videos and realize that's kind of what I defaulted to was figuring out the problem and figuring out how I'm going to solve it in this video environment so that was pretty funny to see all of that put to put into play um to pretty good effect. So that was a lot of fun. But yeah, I think and it can help you draw some of the lines in the sand that are really good to figure out where to draw them when you're sitting in your living room, maybe wondering about it. So maybe you have a line in the sand that I'm never going to let anyone take me anywhere. I would rather you kill me in the parking lot rather than take me anywhere. That is a line I have drawn in the sand and I'm able to draw it in my living room. I don't have to decide that in the parking lot in the moment. And I have several, several lines like that. And seeing these different encounters, it helps you helps you think through where your lines are. What are you willing to do? What are you willing to protect? What are you going to walk away from? All of these things. I think it's super valuable. Yeah, that's a great perspective. And John, mm -hmm. to pick on you again now, uh, that's one of the things that uh, we talked about in, in your class that I took, which by the way was awesome. So if anyone gets a chance to, to train with John, definitely do that. Uh, but yeah, you talked about that as well, like drawing the lines and kind of pre uh I, you called it uh, i think pre need decision making pre, pre, yeah. pre decisions pre -decision. uh, you establish you have to establish mm -hmm. boundaries and you have to recognize that you will have to enforce that boundary otherwise it's not really a boundary uh i i think i talk about that quite a bit in my video series on my youtube channel fbf training is like 10 videos i i flat my gyms for like four hours <laughs> uh and and that's and that's one of the one of the things that i also emphasize my class and I'm, I'm out and about fbftraining.com uh, and, and I'm, I've got 25 or 26 classes around the country this year you go to the website click on the link FPF on the road you'll see a little icon I'm coming to your range very near you uh, and it's all about taking one of the questions I think we, we were going to work on is what other skills should we have well we need to have skills beyond the gun we have to mm -hmm. be able to stop bleeding we have to be able to use, employ a less lethal weapon, uh, pepper spray, for instance. We need to be able to talk to people. A little Toastmasters goes a long way. Uh, the capacity mm -hmm. to swallow your pride and walk away from an incident, it's hard. And yet, the consequences are such that you are, you are going, you're, if you're not taking the off ramps, you're going to end up at a destination that you probably did not want to go to. Uh, mm -hmm. These are things that need to be thrashed out in our mind, and we have to have a, a, a formulation of, of a, a skill set in a box that we can shake together and formulate and execute a plan based upon our pre-decisions, based upon our boundaries. 
And I think Stephanie's is, is a fine one. I will, I will not be moved to a secondary crime scene. Whatever going to happen is going to happen right here and right now. Uh, I won't get on my knees. I won't face away. Or if I do, it's part of a deception plan. It's going to get very loud very shortly after that. Because we all know how these we all know how these stories end. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and okay. Before we get too far uh, off into the weeds, John, where can we find your classes, and when are you coming back to Minnesota? It's fpftraining.com. Uh, hit the calendar, or up on the right, there's a, a, a link that says FPF on the road, and little map icons all across this great land of ours. Uh, Minnesota is in July. I, let me look over my shoulder. Oh, I can't see it. My eyes have gone. I can't see it from here. I think it's like the 17th, 18th of, of, of July. Oh, there's your calendar back there. <laughs> well, let me, can't it, quite see it on the screen. I, <laughs> I, I got I got I got the old so. school. Here we do the whole just turn there we zoom in. Oh yep, yep. Hey, uh, nice. uh -oh. <laughs> and now I've lost you guys. I'll be back. There you are. Uh, but I, I'm all over the country. Uh, Florida, Texas, Seattle, Los, Los Angeles, Texas again, uh, South uh, Nebraska, Colorado, Nebraska? and all points in between. Oh, oh there we go. You, oh done. What a, what a sweet dude. <laughs> I think I'm going to be in his class John in Nebraska. Thank you. So. <laughs> yeah, and that, those are worth traveling for, too, by the way, uh, as is the ASP conference. Um, it's definitely worth a little bit of a drive. So, um, okay, now to kind of get back into it here. Um, so, Stephanie, um, from watching all of those crime videos um, for your, your, your day job with active self-protection, have you learned anything mm -hmm. that has changed your daily habits? Uh, probably just to be ready to be uh, more decisive, f faster, be willing to to escalate quicker if you need to, or or leave if you need to. Um, I think to pick up on what John was talking about earlier, the, the gun is super valuable when it's valuable. Uh, there's mm -hmm. no really great replacement for it when you need it, but there's an awful lot of the time that you don't need it. And if you don't have anything else, if you don't have any sort of soft skills or, I mean, we see situation after situation that is, that is either solved very well with like something like a pepper spray or it's not, and it absolutely could have been and escalated into something absolutely life altering for everyone involved. And I, I don't know how many times I said, uh, if they did just solved that, you know, 30 seconds earlier in the situation with some pepper spray, very likely it could have gone very differently. Or if they just swallowed their ego and walked away, it could have gone very differently. Uh, and then we often see our, our good guy defenders uh, sometimes waiting too long and spending a lot more time reacting than acting. And I think when there's, when there's a time to act, you need, you need to act and you need to act decisively. Um, I would say those are some of my main lessons. Yeah, and that kind of ties into what John was saying earlier about the pre-decision making. Uh, John, what do you mm -hmm. have to add to that? Well, I would like to reinforce a point Stephanie made earlier about uh, a realistic self-assessment of your skill sets and how that can drive your decision decision mm -hmm. chain. You may have to act sooner. If all you can manage mm -hmm. is a three-second draw stroke or a four-second pepper spray presentation, well, then that your your window is much narrower than somebody else who has more capability. So, and, and it all mm -hmm. comes down to that realistic self-assessment. And you can only get that by capturing metrics. And so we're back to the mm -hmm. shot timer and we're back to force on force. And you actually need to, to work to rehearse walking away too. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's a point of, of what both you and Stephanie said that kind of struck me too, is that Stephanie, you were saying that you learned uh, that a lot of people need to act sooner and act, you know, more decisively sooner. And I know for me, knowing my own strength and strengths and weaknesses, that is something that I would need to work on is acting soon enough. Uh, but there might be mm -hmm. other people listening that, that they might be more of like a hair trigger and they might need to work on right. slowing down a little bit. So, so that does kind of tie into that realistic self-assessment and, you know, see what it is that you need and uh, what it is that, will complement your skills the best. Uh, and right. John, I'm yeah, also I, curious. I, oh, go ahead. 
I was just going to say I couldn't I couldn't agree more. Um, I tend more towards your side of that. That I would rather I'm I'm decent with my words. I would rather try to continue to to deescalate something and see if it's possible. Probably too long and too far. So that's something that I try to be very aware of in myself and notice that there is there's very little penalty for even deploying pepper spray and completely incorrectly. At best, you're going to get charged with something like a simple assault, but it's a lower level of force even than, than any type of physical violence. So I think there's a really good argument for using it very, very soon in the attempt to avoid escalating force even to to hands on that that's a pretty serious jump with more uh, consequences and repercussions. So uh, I, I, I'm like, you know, I just try to sort of mentally stay in that remember that that's a place where I have a weaker spot. And I have to work on that both mentally and in my skill set. Yeah, absolutely. And just a reminder for for everyone watching, we have an, ep uh, an episode on pepper spray with Chuck Haggard. So if you go to the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus page, click on the live tab and just scroll back until you find the pepper spray episode. There's a lot more information on pepper spray specifically in that episode. Uh, John, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Absolutely. We can't become gun centric. Uh, and it's very easy mm -hmm. to do that. Uh, because we can capture metrics. We, got, we have our friend the timer, which can also be our enemy the timer. And we, we will work on that, that blazing B8 at 25 yards, but we can't talk to somebody to convince them, hey, would you back up, please? We don't have that in our skill set. Or like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Hey, here's an idea, let's call the cops. Like this. You stay on that side of the car, I'll stay on this side of the car, and let's call the cops. We, we don't have that capacity uh, I, I have a love-hate relationship with shot timers uh, and, other, and, other, and such drills, but recognizing that we are human beings, we've only got so much time to apportion, we have to be very wise. We've got jobs, families, what have you. We have to apportion our time where the greater need likelihood is. But we have, at the end of it, though, we've got those low, low likelihood, high impact events, and they are out there. For sure. Yeah. And from your experience teaching, what would you say is one skill that students can master that, that could potentially make the biggest difference in their daily lives? Keeping their mouths shut. <laughs> That's such an undervalued, underrated skill. <laughs> you're, you're a rah, 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 rah. Okay. You got me. All right. And, and you, you've just vented your spleen. That's great. But... There, there is a point, though. I, I, we, we, we have to have a dial. I think that's a better way of saying it. Mm -hmm. uh, some people are just switches or on or off. We need to have a dial. And we have to have that capacity to dial it all the way up to 11. Or like, hey, you, you, I'm, let me look at it from your perspective. You know, that's a good point. Maybe I should just leave. And we can dial it down to zero and everyone walks away. And, but this is a, a part of our, our conflict spectrum, which is just uh, – Interaction in a bar, something like that. Uh, the odd bump, like this isn't really a criminal, criminal activity at the, out, at the outset, but it can devolve into that very easily if we're not careful because fighting is against the law. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I have been using videos for some time myself. I've got one of a bar in Norfolk. It was uh, the Redskins, now uh, the, the team or whatever, versus the Cowboys. And it was absolutely colors and totally tribal. And mm -hmm. it went to a shove. The shove ended up with someone hitting his head on the, on the floor, some girl hematoma, and he died. Mm -hmm. over, over, over something as silly as a football game. But, and, and well, going back to, to Stephanie, when, according to Dr. April, they're not like us. And there's, there's somebody out there right mm -hmm. now that, that, that they identify with that team so much that violence is not off the table. Mm hmm yeah. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, you never really know when you're going to encounter that. So <laughs> it's definitely good to kind of pre-think a lot of these things. And, you know, something you guys mention a lot on the Active Self-Protection channel is uh, spiritual fitness. Uh, Stephanie, can you tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about that before we go here? We're running a little short on time, but I, I think that's an important sure. topic to kind of leave people with. Absolutely. Yeah, I think there, there's several components to it, depending on most of the staff at Active Self-Protection is believers. So for us, that means 
um, uh, knowing it, that we stand okay with, and our relationship with Jesus is okay, you can take that farther to also mean that your relationships with your family are okay, that you've done what you need to do and said what you need to say, to say because uh, unfortunately we can do everything that we can to prepare and there are just unwinnable fights and there are just lucky happenstances for the bad guy that, that you can do everything correct and you can still lose and you need to be uh, mentally, emotionally, spiritually prepared that none of us have today have today promised. And, and I think that's a really healthy healthy way to approach all of it. I know it's something a lot of people have difficulty with whenever we present a video that there really has sort of an unwinnable scenario. Um, they really struggle with that idea. Uh, they, they just think if they could do this or if they could shoot that or that they could solve it and you can't convince them otherwise. And and so I, I think uh, uh, learning about some, some spiritual fitness there and, and just being ready and accepting and, and standing where you need to stand um, can be super helpful. Yeah, I like that a lot. And I'm I'm personally not religious, but I do appreciate the um, just the concept of being at peace with yourself and being in a good place mm -hmm. in your life as best you can. Like you can't always control your circumstances, but but, you know, like right. maybe I'll finish that unfinished business to the extent that I can so that mm -hmm. I can live a more uh, healthy and, and constructive life. Right. All right that's right. That has a repercussions far beyond the self-defense realm for certain. Yeah, it seems like a lot of this stuff really does, which is kind of cool. And yeah. uh, John, anything anything you want to leave people with before we head out for the night? Be a pleasant person. Accept <laughs> fault in others. Have you ever cut somebody off? I have. Uh, <laughs> have you ever? Have you ever? I, I, I've caught myself twice now in the era of the Rona in the checkout line. Like, oh, that's an open checkout, and I walk in, and I turn around. And, oh no. There was there was physical distance, and that's why the line wasn't there. Like, hey, dummy, catch up, catch up. Little another situational <laughs> awareness fail, failure there. Uh, and, and, and we've you've already touched on it. Going about your life, had had this program running in the background, but it, it's it's never been this good. It really has never been mm -hmm. this good. Yeah, that's really good. Well, thank you so much, guys, for joining us. This has been an awesome episode. I really feel like I learned a lot. Uh, and I want to also thank our viewers. Thank you for watching Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. Make sure and tune in next week where we're going to be talking about hunting. We'll cover how to get started and some tips for a successful hunt. That's going to be uh, next Wednesday, October 21st at 7 p.m. Thanks for watching and good night. <laughs>